get the privilege of meeting Pastor Shane, right, Shane, down here from Mamre Baptist. And he's come up to see his dear friend, Pastor John. I'm not sure why, but he... <laughs> Uh, no, what a blessing, what a blessing. Um, it's also a great blessing to have Judd Hatcher with us. And uh, I've asked Judd uh, to spend about 15 minutes just updating us on his life and what he's been through, uh, anything he wants to share about the work in Brazil. Um, it's just a thrill. Thank you for driving over here, bro, and coming to be with us. We're blessed to have you, and thank you for being willing to share. We love you. And uh, I've known this man for a long time. So sorry. I, I have, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm definitely not sorry at all. I'm, I, am, I am elated to have you as a friend, as, as I am to have so many of you. As a, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about this uh, as I was driving over. I remember whenever Brother uh, Ed Overby was still the, uh, the BFM secretary, and um, I was about eight years old, and we came to the U.S. We were in Lexington, and then we went to this uh, buffet. And uh, so I looked at Mom and kind of whispered, said, he looks like Ronald Reagan. And if you remember Edward Overby, who's a little younger, he actually did look like Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was also the president at the time. And uh, so... Ed Overby overheard me. He said, oh, yeah, I get that all the time, Judson. And as a matter of fact, I go exercising at Turfman Mall, and I have to walk with my head down. Otherwise, I'll get stopped all the time. But one of the advantages of walking with my head down is, is that I find coins as I walk along. <laughs> and so the next time that we went to, to the mall with my family, I was walking around, and my mother said, so what are you doing? I'm pretending to be Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, but I have wonderful memories growing up and, and the different uh, pastors that were connected with Baptist Faith Missions and the churches that supported uh, the missionaries throughout. And let me tell you, Brother Draper, behind, this is an old adage, of course, behind every great man is an extraordinary woman. So, thank you, Mrs. Draper. For being extraordinary. So what I'd like to do for you tonight is, uh, of course, this is my family. Uh, Raquel and I, we met whenever I was 14 years old, so I've known her for a long time. Um, those who do not know our context uh, as a family, uh, Raquel was, uh, uh, her parents were New Tribes missionaries. They were from Brazil. Lived, from, it lived in Sao Paulo, came up north, thus the reason why we met. Uh, I was 14, and uh, so we've known each other for a long time. Our oldest daughter is Sarah. She turned 17 here on the 30th. Laura, who's over there, and I'll go ahead and ask both of my kids to stand up so you can see them. So Laura and Benjamin. And uh, <clears throat> Laura will be 16 in July, and Benjamin will just turn 14 on uh, the 24th. So we've, this last weekend, we had a, a celebratory weekend because we celebrated Sarah, we celebrated Benjamin, and we celebrated God's gift to me. And let me tell you, the prayer of the righteous availeth much. So thank you for praying. Because I am cancer free. I am, I am grateful, very grateful for that. Um, and at first, my response was, I'm going to keep this a little bit more private. Uh, and I really only shared it with my immediate family and with the directors of Baptist Faith Missions because I knew that we needed to be prayed for. And after I saw the result of the effectual prayers of these men and their spouses, I thought, what am I doing? I need to get the word out to all of my friends. I need to have everybody that knows the man Jesus that has surrendered their life to him and that have the Lord as their Savior, as 
it's their God. They need to be praying for and interceding to God on my behalf. So I reached out to as many people as I could. Because the more people that I knew that were righteous in the sight of God were, were going to be praying for me, that's what I wanted. Don't you want that as well? And the message that was just preached, don't we also need to be praying for that? That the proper gospel is laid out in the open and that we go out about doing the Lord's business out in the field? And may the Lord give us the boldness to do just that. And that is my prayer. Shall we pray that way this weekend? In the midst of all the challenges that we will have to deal with? And we'll hear more about it here in just a moment. I'm, I'm, in, I'm actually excited to hear what you have to say. A uh, very pertinent topic. Thank you so much for such a great choice. But I, I only have 15 minutes. And I'm, you know, I'm getting worked up already. So um, about five, six years ago, the last time that I was, we were here in the U.S., I showed you about a three-minute video. And I'm going to show you the video again. So again, it gives you a scope of why we went to Sao Paulo. And, and then I'm going to follow up with what have we done since then, and a lot has happened. So let's start out with this video, and it should be right on cue, and here we go. some pictures of what's been going on but before that I also want to show you some history in this next image that I want to begin with and you'll absolutely love this some of you may have already seen this and there we go 
You realize who this is in this picture? So at the very far right at the top, that's John Albert Hatcher. So, and of course my grandmother, Alta Hatcher, immediately to his right. Uh, and then in front are my youngest aunt, Kathy, David, John, who's a missionary in France. Of course, uh, Kathy is wife to Odali, who will be sharing tomorrow. And then David, who still serves in Manaus. And then John, my uncle, who serves in France. And then my dad, uh, who served for many, many years uh, in Manaus and really throughout the country, um, and now takes care of his father in Clermont, Florida. And that is also a call of God, by the way. And, um, and then the other folks you may also recognize. You see the Bratchers up there? Or Sister Marie Bratcher. I think it was probably uh, Brother Bratcher who was taking the picture. But then you also see who else is there in the center. That's Brother Wallace York, who served as one of the directors of Last Faith Mission for many years as well. And, of course, his spouse, Doris York. And in her lap, Herschel York. So it uh, kind of gives you some context there. And the house that you see in the background is the house my father grew up in, which coincidentally, praise the Lord, was also the house that I grew up in. And uh, so this is uh, a town, uh, this is Manaus, which now has about 2.5 million people. And I was looking up some stats. Chicago, city limits, of course, the metropolitan area, there's a lot more. But within the city limits, there's 2.7 million people. So I'm thinking, you know what? I was born in Manaus, almost as large as Chicago. So what about that, huh? Uh, so anyways, this is Manaus. Manaus is right on the Amazon River, uh, middle of the Amazon Basin. And uh, this was actually, uh, so this is like the Hatcher homestead, if you will, there in the city of Manaus. Um, and so let's go on. I've got just a few minutes, and I've got a ton to share with the images, but I'll let the images do the speaking. So, of course, my grandparents, you see here, uh, Grandpa graduating one of his seminary graduates there. That's Pastor Joubert Stefano, which is a beacon of leadership amongst the churches there. You see some... Uh, picture there of one of the churches and then the two other pastors. This is Pastor Joubert just recently. He and I, uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of communication for plans for the future. And this is Pastor Sergio. Um, and uh, so our plans are to continue working together the, and tying the ministry of the first generation in with ministry of the third generation. And, uh, uh, and the truth about it is, is that I'm, I'm actually Brazilian first, American second. I grew up speaking Portuguese. I, at times I find myself not thinking in Portuguese, but fishing for words in English because my flow is so much better in Portuguese. And uh, uh, so if you catch, if it, if it looks like I'm looking for words, it's because I am, okay? Uh, because I am Brazilian. And, and I, I take that on fully. So up here, the green, that's the Amazon region, uh, to the orange, that is the northeastern. And the yellow, you see Cuiabá, that's where the draper served, that's where the turner served. Uh, and then on, in the blue, you see the last city there, Sao Paulo, that's where we are currently living. And then the most southern three states, that is uh, the south and mostly the European. Uh, and then, of course, the northeast, you have a lot of uh, African influence. And then in the, in the green region, you have a lot of indigenous uh, Amazonian looking influence. So I grew up uh, in a culture where uh, it was normal to take three showers a day. I mean, who takes three showers a day in America, right? Uh, but um, so whenever Americans came to visit us, and you know, sometimes Americans only take three showers a week. And uh, so that made a lasting impression on some of my friends. <coughs> Uh, the next image, uh, we've always done some, some great uh, opportunities to engage with people. I mean, how do you arrive somewhere and connect with people? Well, you've got you to gotta build bridges, right? So we've done uh, picnics, we've done cookouts. Over here to the bottom left, 
this is an Italian dinner that we did. We had a, a friend of mine came in and sang some Italian music, and we did uh, some Italian cuisine. It was just an extraordinary. This is in my garage, by the way, because we got rained out. So we had to pull all the tables in underneath my garage, but it made it so special. And my neighbors came over, and it was just, just an incredible experience. And then, of course, you see, I love this picture on the top right. See, I, I look like Superman in that picture. Don't you love it? <coughs> and then the next picture... Uh, is this is one of the very first ministries that we were a part of. Uh, this was an English ministry that we got rolling, and there in the city of Sao Paulo. The next image is of a Spanish plant, uh, and these, these people from Mexico, from Peru, um, from Argentina, from Chile, uh, Bolivia, you name it, this is uh, friends that we were able to connect with. And uh, the Lord has given me the privilege of learning to speak Spanish. I'm not as fluent in it as in Portuguese, but I, I can get around. I, I do okay. And the next image, this is uh, a really a church revitalization. They were This was a church that at the time was 47 years old, and they had been out without a pastor for 11 years, and they were getting ready to close down the building, sell, and donate the proceeds elsewhere. And uh, the Lord intervened, and I got connected with him. We had some meetings, uh, and I suggested there's a man I think that, that you would love, and he would connect with you guys here. So I suggested a friend of mine who had trained my very, my, the first wedding that I celebrated was his. So he came down to visit uh, twice. The church loved him, and he's doing an excellent job, and it makes it easier for me because now we're partnering in ministry, and he's one that's kind of taking care of things while we're... Uh, while we're out. And so this is the ch the, some of the folks there. The church has really grown uh, since he's been there as well. And then the next image, uh, so this is Pastor Elder, and, uh, and then over here to the right, these, this is Pastor Elder and another friend, Marcos is his name, and uh, he actually pastors the, a church that I started also several years ago up in Manaus. And then we'll go through some more pictures because I'm just going to have to breeze through. And then this is uh, some more pictures there of the ministry uh, there in that church. And then there was another church that we started in the favelas there in Sao Paulo, which is the slums. And this is, you see over to the left, this is a scenario with, where the kids was at. It's very difficult ministry because on weekends, it's hard to get the parents to come out to any of the meetings because they're either too drunk or too high. And, uh, and then most of my, my time with the parents was usually at home, uh, attempting to, you know, to converse with them, to preach the pure gospel. Because that's what they need to hear. The only hope that they have is not the financial assistance that they'll receive from the government. Because that will all vanish. And probably in very unnecessary ways. But the only thing that will not vanish is whenever they put their trust in Jesus. And that's what we're doing. Pointing people to that. And so here's Raquel teaching the kids. And you can see some of... And our kids have obviously got very engaged and all that there. Just looking at these pictures, I'm sure that my, my kids also have wonderful memories and, and think back through all of this. And then, so that was one. And then this is another uh, plant that we've been doing. It's uh, started in homes in different contexts. And uh, so in discipleship, I have so many stories to tell you about this here. Uh, and uh, so let's go, go ahead and move on to the next picture. This is uh, the Imagine Church started at Ground Zero. And we were able to lease a building from another church, an American church that uh, had services in Sao Paulo City. They have services in the morning. We asked to lease their building on Sunday nights. They granted us permission. I had the keys to the building. And uh, this was the very last Sunday that we were there. Of course, you see Pastor Elder to, uh over there on the bottom right. And this was kind of gearing things up for him. Then, of course, you've also heard of Brother AJ's ministry with the seminary. And here is, uh, I was translating for Pastor Zick who came in to do a course. And then, of course, with COVID, we had to do everything online. Uh, and we do a lot of training as well. And, uh, but this opened up the opportunity for us to be able to expand our reach with online teaching. So there's actually several different churches that were actually in these different sessions that you see here on these images to the left. And then going over, uh, right before coming to the U.S., I said, hey, Pastor Elbid, there's a church up in João Pessoa, which is in the northeast, that orange area that you saw earlier on the map. Uh, They've, they've, been, they've been trucking along, but they need a boost, so let's go visit them. So this is uh, Pastor Rizal that you see, and we put together a, a plaque and honoring him. And uh, I said, hey, we're coming to visit you. 
uh, would you allow me to, about five, ten minutes within the service, I, I would like to honor you. So he knew that something was up. Um, but he actually invited me to speak that evening, so I spoke, and then we had the moment to invite the whole church planting team that had originally been trained in Manaus and then went to Jean Pessoa, and then you see all of them up there, and we're all dear friends, and we had a great time together that weekend. And over here to the right, that's his team. And over here, sitting down, that is Elder's older brother, who was just recently ordained to the gospel ministry. And all of these men up here were either trained by my father or myself. So, and so the work keeps, keeps going on. Over here to the right, you have Ivan, uh, who's also a, pa- uh, a pastor. Yeah, right there. And, and more guys here at the bottom and their spouses. And then we can go ahead and flip over to the next image. Uh, Julio uh, participated in my pastoral um, team and trains. We met from 10.30 at night. We finished at 1 o'clock in the morning. These guys that participated in these trainings with me, they worked all day. Were, most of them were working on their master's or graduate school work uh, in the evenings. And the only time that they had available was 10.30 at night. And they were all volunteers. And they came because they wanted to. And they never skipped a beat. And there's, here's Pastor Julio and the, the church plant that he did. And of course, you see there Elden and then another church up there and another church up there. And then this is another church. We did a lot of things with kids and, and, uh, and courts. And, and uh, we'll flip over to the next picture. And then this is the gathering of pastors and their spouses in some different occasions where we've had what we've called pastores amigos, which is pastor friends. So a fellowship of pastors and the interconnectivity amongst us uh, as we go about doing weekly ministry. And uh, it's, just, it's just exciting. Don't you love these pictures? Just to see these pictures. Man, get me on board. I'm playing right now. I'm ready to go back. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, we've done... This was, the French, this was the French evening that we had for a couple's weekend. And uh, where we had a five-course meal. We had servers that came in with, with platters on their hands. And it was wee, 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 wee. And uh, uh, we had all the menu in French. Nobody could read a word of what it said. It was perfect. And, uh, but the gospel was preached. And, uh, but they knew what they were eating because it was fish from the Amazon, let me tell you. And uh, so this is, uh, whenever we go back now, Jonathan and Cadiz will be working with us. Jonathan is a very unique individual. He actually came just recently to the U.S. past, was here for a full month, gaining some exposure, and just kind of, you know, this guy has a genius IQ, photographic memory, and for those of you who understand music, having the perfect pitch, usually most people have a static perfect pitch. He has a non-static perfect pitch. He learned how to play the piano in two weeks and passed the exam to get into the music school at the University of Amazonas, which is pretty big accomplishment. So, uh, and this guy, he's, and he's only 25 years old. I mean, my, my kids will attest to just his knowledge, depth, and just, he, my kids love him because he knows how to speak to them. But he'll take on any of us in here to talk about theology. And he'll probably give you a whipping because he can quote stuff from memory. Well, we might still fumble around. Well, let me pull my app out. He'll, he'll do it from memory. Uh, and uh, so, and then Raquel... Within the last uh, couple of years, she's been involved in foster care. Uh, just, just, just an incredible story how the Lord just opened up all of this. And so she's been at the cutting edge uh, within the foster care for the country, really, because whatever happens in Sao Paulo, if it's consolidated, it will propagate throughout the rest of the country. And uh, so uh, Raquel has been kind of at the forefront of that, and the Lord just kind of really pulled her in and put her in a very unique place for that, so she's had a lot of influence. And even on here in the U.S., she's still, this little baby here is, you know, the court system had called her to come in at about 11 o'clock at night to pick up this baby to take in to a new foster home. And in Brazil, you say foster care, you still have to explain what foster care means. So it's a totally new system, and I've probably run over my 15 minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. This is my family. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to hearing you. And uh, may the Lord bless you in this next part. And I'm going to pass this off to you. Well, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, it is a great honor and privilege uh, to be with you here this evening. Uh, I thank you, Pastor Mark, for allowing me to come and stand in your pulpit and trust in me in this sacred place. I do not take it lightly. When I first came to uh, Faith Baptist and um, the process in which I was candidating, uh, they had a question and answer uh, session right before a service that I preached. And right out of the bat, a man by the name of Woody Piles uh, said, what do you believe about particular redemption? And I thought, he just blew the cat out of the bag. And uh, the Lord had given me a great privilege to, to share the truth on that. And uh, I think I had two amens at that time. And uh, so I was really nervous, uh, thinking, okay, maybe this isn't the place that the Lord would have for me to go. And I had the great privilege uh, to spend the afternoon with the Van Meter family that are John and Kim that are here with us and and I thought they're not for this and so I sat down with them at lunchtime and they're like we loved your answer and I'm like yes thank you Lord and uh, so uh, getting to know Woody uh, he said you would really love to get to know my son Mark and uh, and I have and Valerie and uh, I have enjoyed the first time I met them it was uh, like kindred spirits and and I'm thankful for that and um, I'm blessed to know them and that he is here faithfully preaching uh, the true word of God the pure gospel this is a high calling <laughs> to speak upon this topic uh, the subject of critical race theory and wokeism the church we are living in unique times, and I would even dare to say unprecedented times. What do I mean by unprecedented? Well, throughout history, we understand that there has been an element or of some degree of debauchery in society. As Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, verse 27, men doing that which is unnatural. We know that's nothing new. That has been taking place ever since the fall but what we are witnessing today in society today is the reprobate mind carrying out to the fullest extent the unnatural and depraved actions of their delusion by having things such as gender reassignment surgeries and taking hormones that disrupt and counteract the natural processes Ultimately, what we find is that this is a rebellion against the image of our Creator. But that's the heart of man left in his depraved state. That would be each and every one of us. If God would have not have intervened in our broken, fallen hearts, you and I would be the same. Because the heart is deceitful above all things, and we know this, and it is desperately wicked, and left to itself, that wicked, desperate heart will carry out to the fullest extent its rebellion against a holy and righteous God. But let us not lose heart, church. God is in control. And He always will be. This season of life that God has allowed us to be in currently is not by coincidence. He's allowed us to live in this dark season of life giving us opportunities, unique opportunities, to live out our faith in light of the Gospel. It's like, as I've heard before, like a jeweler that would take a bright diamond and he would put it up against a black backdrop to show forth the brilliance of that diamond. And here we've been given this opportunity as Christians, as heralders of this pure Gospel truth, in the midst of a dark season, and in this dark season, the gospel will shine brightly. Truly, we must be like a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. The light shines brighter, my friends, in the darkest of nights. Our firm stance and commitment to, to truth, it will be tested. But that which endures will be the telltale sign of what sort of faith your faith is built up on. True faith, saving faith, is a faith that endures. Jesus did not tell His disciples that they were going to be sent out amongst a world that would accept them. On the contrary, 
Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16, then verses 21 and 22, he said to them that he was going to send them out as sheep amongst wolves. Verse 21 and 22, and he says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the child shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated for my name's sake, but he that endures till the end shall be saved. Be sure, church, that the reason that the world hates you, the reason the world hates the church, the church that preaches the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, is because it hated Jesus Christ first. And if the world hates you, my friends, you're in good company. Because you're in company with Jesus. Though my topic for this evening is critical race theory and wokeism, I, don't, I do not want that to be our focus. You know, we're going to certainly talk about that, but I don't want that to be our focus. There should be nothing that should detract us, detract our attention away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is centered to everything that we do and everything that we are. Therefore, our commitment must be to the faithful study and the faithful proclamation of God's wonderful, eternal, infallible truth. His word will endure. All other things pass away, but God's word endures forever. I love what Charles Spurgeon once said about the word of God. I'm sure many of you have heard this. Charles Spurgeon said, the word of God is like a lion. You do, you do not have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose. The lion will defend itself. Don't you love that? That is the word of God. We don't have to make it something else. It is already pure. It is already powerful. It is already in eternal. It is already infallible. We do not have to dress it up. We don't have to make it something that the world can accept. No, it is what it is and it is powerful. And we take it as it is and we present it as it is. So here on our topic this evening, though, we do want to talk about critical race theory and wokeism. So what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is a study that began in the late 60s and early 70s, and it sought out reasons for the racial inequalities and disparities in society. The theory suggested that racial bias, intentional or unintentional, is woven into the very fabric of Western society, and especially in America. Vody Bauckham, one of my favorite preachers, he said in his book, Fault Lines, if you've had not had the opportunity to read it yet, I would encourage you to read that. It is a more in-depth study of critical race theory and wokeism. And Vody Bauckham put much study in this, and he articulates it in a much better fashion than even I. But he says in his book, critical race theory teaches that the only way to know truth is to elevate black, marginalized voices and listen to their stories. People and their feelings become arbiters of truth, and anyone who disagrees with those feelings is either a racist or has internalized racism. And so here, along with critical race theory, we also have, and we cannot uh, miss this, is intersectionality. All of this kind of goes together. What is intersectionality? Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. But intersectionality is the concept that all oppression is linked. Racism, homophobia, transphobia, fat phobia, all of these phobias. If you are against anybody that is in a lifestyle of sin, you are considered someone who is, has a phobia against those people and therefore you're labeled a bigot. Here, the Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as this. It is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, regarded as creating, overlapping, and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression, and we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people whether it's their gender, race, class, sexual orientation, physical ability, and so on and so on and so on. What this ultimately boils down to is that everyone is oppressed, with the exception of white, straight, 
conservative masculine men. Everyone else is oppressed. In this school of thought, no one is responsible for their own actions. The drug lord who's peddling drugs is a victim of racism and white supremacy. And because of this, the drug lord is forced to seek other means of income. The act of prostitution is no longer shameful for the woman is using her body as a means of empowerment over men. Those who are incarcerated, those who are in prisons are not responsible for their own crimes. Why? Because they are a product of a society whose very laws and systems were created to keep them oppressed. All of this is under the umbrella of critical race theory. This is the mindset of those who hold to critical race theory. Those who hold to this in theory interpret the world through that lens. Critical race theory seeks to undermine absolute truth. It does not hold people accountable for their actions. And through that lens, the only answer to, social, to the social ills of society is for the oppressed to become the oppressors. Guilt, then, is derived from the pressure of the culture rather than a greater understanding of the gospel. And only those who are woke, here's where your wokeism comes in, what does woke mean? It's not really a difficult term to understand, but it's a term that defines those who have become aware or have been enlightened of the social injustices of society. They have reached a level of inner righteousness. They have been awakened to the ills of society and they are the only arbiters of truth. Only the ones who are woke can understand the oppressed. Woke, in one definition, refers to being aware or well-informed in a political or cultural sense, especially regarding issues surrounding marginalized communities. In order to quit being transphobic or homophobic or fatphobic or any other kind of phobic, you must become woke. You must become enlightened. You must understand that you, if you're white, are the oppressor and that you inadvertently have oppressed others where you've done so intentionally or unintentionally. And church, understand this. It is an attempt to become relative. Many churches have fallen prey to this. Many churches have become, if you will, woke and therefore they have acquiesced to the current culture. Many pastors that I once looked up to have apologized for their white privilege and although unintentionally even apologized for their racism. Several pastors that I've looked to up in the past have caved to social pressures and instead of bearing up under the gospel, they've conceded holy ground in attempts to please the ire of men. Church, understand this. I would rather offend a million men than to offend the God that I serve. We are called, church, to obedience. And that obedience is not to the culture pressures that we face today. That obedience is to the Word of God and to the Word of God alone. Not to acquiesce to the culture in which we live. And we must always bear in mind what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 12, 6, verse 12. The brother read it earlier. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As we cover this topic this evening, I do not want to make flesh and blood our enemies. Those who are trans people, those who are homosexuals, they are not our enemies, my friends. We want to win them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order for them to truly be changed, it's not going to become, they're not going to change through debate or through argument. It's not going to be changed through logic. It has to be the power of God through the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ and salvation only through Him will men be changed just like you sitting here today. So these people are not our enemies. They may look at us as enemies, but they are not our enemies. We do not wrestle against, wrestle against flesh and blood. We have one enemy, and that is the, the devil himself. So let us look at why critical race theory is an obstacle to the gospel I agree with Brother Mark, because there's nothing truly an obstacle to the gospel. It permeates and breaks through even the most hardened heart, the hardest walls. Nothing can stop the gospel, but there is obstacles for us in preaching the gospel. 
I was talking to a brother earlier. He's facing some obstacles at church. Every pastor faces obstacles. So certainly here, critical race theory and wokeism is, a, is an obstacle for us, especially in the church. So what we find here, the strategies of the enemy has never changed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul wrote that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We know the plans of Satan. We know his tactics. The Apostle Paul wrote also uh, to the Colossians in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after tr the tradition of men, after the rudiments, after the world, and not after Christ. That rudiments means something elementary, something, something simple, something foolish, something silly. Do not be spoiled. Do not allow someone to rob you of what you have in Christ. Do not give in to the philosophies, the vain philosophies of the world. So before we begin, I want to ask you this question. What is the best way to dispel a lie? It is to know the truth. And God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. Dear Christian, we must hold forth the Word of God before us and let it lead us. We are to hide God's Word in our heart so that we would not sin against Him. So we must know truth. It is vitally important that we know more about the Bible than we know about critical race theory. It is vitally more important that we know God's truth than we know what it means to be woke. If we want to win a Hindu or a Muslim to Christ, we don't need to know about Hinduism. We do not need to know about Islam. We just need to know the Gospel. And the glorious light of the Gospel will penetrate the darkest hearts. So first we see this obstacle, the first obstacle I want to discuss about critical race theory is that it is a deception. It is a lie. There's a little bit of truth mixed with a whole lot of error. And here Jesus, what did He say about Satan? That He was a murderer from the beginning. There was no truth in Him. And that He is the father of lies. Here the genesis of all lies begins in Satan himself. All forms of deception have originated from the father of lies. Here, the enemy of our soul seeks to destroy the truth of the Word of God, or at the very least to undermine God's truth in attempts to cause people to question the infallibility of His truth. This was Satan's strategy from the very beginning, my friends, as we turn back to the book of Genesis, there in the garden, he said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he... That serpent said unto the woman, Has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the trees, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in that day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as God's, knowing good and evil you see satan tries to get you to question god's word that's what he did to adam and eve to question did god really say critical race theory appears to the heart, appeals to the heart of man that has a works-based righteousness and the only means of atonement are work are wrought out in penance instead of completely trusting in the finished work of christ isn't that what adam and eve did here, once they realized their eyes were open, they saw they had no clothes on. In their failed attempt, they sewed fig leaves together to try to cover up their shame. And men are still the same today, but instead of sewing fig leaves together, they find themselves trying to do good works to try to make themselves feel better for their shame. You see, the devil's tactics or to undermine the truth of God's Word and to cause some to question the authority of the Bible. He wants them to question this. Did God really say? Did He really mean? Certainly God would not punish someone for all of eternity just for not believing in Him. Certainly God sees your good works and He's happy with what you do. All you have to do 
is be a good person. And what we have found is that many current denominations in our world today have acquiesced to Satan's lies and his deceptions. Satan always tries to counterfeit God's truth. He replaces it with rules and laws that appeal to men. Therefore, righteousness is gained through human merit, not as a means of pleasing God, but rather as a means of pleasing self for the individual is his or her own God. The church then becomes seeker friendly, a seeker friendly social club that has to tippy that has to tippy toe around people's feelings for fear of offending someone afraid that they might leave the church. Certainly the last thing we would want to do in a church is offend someone, right? No. God's word offends the conscience of the wicked, depraved heart. When God's word, church, is faithfully preached or taught, it will offend. It cuts like a two-edged sword. We do not have to be offensive just for the sake of being offensive. Pastors, missionaries, just preach the truth. Tell the truth, and people will be offended. Not only is critical race theory a deception, I also find that it is a diversion. It casts your gaze upon something else. It turns your eyes and your attention to something else. We have witnessed many churches shifting from focusing on the gospel uh, through the social ills of the day, especially through critical race theory. They've shifted their focus from the gospel to focusing on social issues And they call it social justice. John MacArthur says justice needs, does not need an adjective. Arguing that the biblical concept concept of justice gets distorted if it's given social dimensions. It is just simply justice. And it is God's justice. And God will meet out right justice because he is a just God to put any other adjective in front of it fails to fully preach and proclaim the purity of the gospel. Some churches believe that in order to be relevant and to reach the lost, the church must help heal the hurt by addressing the social ills that impact society today. Again, Vody Bauckham in his book, Fault Lines, which addresses critical race theory and wokeism. Vody said that critical race theory, it is another gospel. He said this, he said about critical race theory, this is a religious movement. It has all the trappings of a religion. It has its own cosmology, it has, or cosmology, it has its own saints, it has its own liturgy, it has its own law, it has all those elements. And a lot of those things are very subtle, which makes them rather attractive to religious people. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6 through verse 10, He told these dear believers, as the brother mentioned earlier, he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach, any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And what we have found today, many churches acquiescing to the social norms of today in order to be relevant, in order to be pleasing unto men, in order to tickle itching ears. And that is what has happened today. And they have ceased, my friends, to be servants of Christ Jesus. The focus of those churches who have embraced critical race theory or elements of it, their focus has become the poor, the disenfranchised, the minorities, the oppressed. Now we wouldn't say as a church, as believers, that those things are not important. For James says in James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. As Christians, we must care about these things. But those are not our focus. The focus always must be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why, what does it matter if we would pull someone out of poverty, but yet fail to show them Christ? 
What does it matter if we relieve the oppressed and the disenfranchised and, do, and they do not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? What benefit has it if they do not have a relationship with Jesus? We can lift everyone out of poverty. But if we do not show them Jesus, we've utterly failed. The psalmist in Psalm 140, verse 12, he says, I know the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. In Leviticus 19, 15, we read, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thy judge thy neighbor. Jesus told his disciples that they would always have the poor with them. That doesn't mean that we don't care about the plight of the poor. But it does mean that that is not our driving force. Our driving force is not the poor person. Our driving force is not the homeless person. Our driving force truly and always must be the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those who know Christ, even in our darkest moments, we don't lose hope. Because we are in Christ and we have His Word abiding in us, when we despair, we do not lose heart. Why? For we are led by the Spirit of Christ that abides in us. So here, when there's always going to be trials. There's always going to be testing. And if the Word of God and the Spirit of God is not abiding us and enabling us to live out His, uh, His, His Word to the lost and dying world, we've totally failed. Here, the answer for those who are proponents for the critical race theory instead of the gospel is equal pay. But for the Christian, the answer is godliness with contentment is great gain. Whereas the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and the Apostle Paul wasn't talking about winning a football game. He wasn't talking about throwing a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. What was he talking about there? The Apostle Paul says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound in all things. I know how to live for Christ's glory. How come? Because it is Christ that strengthens him. For those who trust in a sovereign God, we trust by faith that God allows us to be in certain positions, in certain situations for the, a purpose. And though we might not know that exact purpose at the moment, we can be confident of this, that it is for, his, for our good and His glory. Critical race theory is just a repackaged form, really, of Marxism that seeks to divide and conquer. Critical race theory is divisive. We've seen it in churches today. We've seen it amongst faithful churches. Those who once held to a pure gospel divided on these lines. It is divisive. In Titus chapter 3, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Critical race theory, it is unprofitable and it is empty. Again, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, he says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Those who once held to a pure gospel, who have now acquiesced to the culture and to society, here by good words and fair speeches, they've deceived the hearts of the simple. According to Marx, I quote, one could no longer be content with interpreting the world. One must be concerned with transforming it, which meant transforming both the world itself and human consciousness of it. And this is the entire premise of critical race theory. They see that the world can be transformed by relieving the oppressed through wealth distribution, giving up land and possessions for the good of the community. This is the only way for every individual to find true peace, they say, true happiness, and true commitment if everyone is on the same playing field. 
But not once did we see Jesus addressing these social issues of the day. It was always the Gospel. Jesus says, I am the truth and the life. There's no one that comes from the Father but by Him. True peace, true joy only come through Christ Jesus. But critical race theory attempts to bring about division. It it tries to bring about a racial divide. But it also seeks to define what is morally right and what is morally wrong. Again, you are seen as a bigot if you call sin, sin. If you do not agree with their premise that a trans man is truly a man, or a trans woman is truly a woman, you are therefore labeled a transphobic and therefore you are a bigot. If you do not wholeheartedly agree with the teaching, with teaching children about LGBTQIA+, you are therefore labeled a homophobic and therefore a bigot. And many churches today have fallen prey to this ideology. And though they may not agree with the lifestyle, they are unwilling to call it what it is, an abomination. There are, t- there are churches that teach their congregation that they need to understand why people are the way they are. They credit past abuses, absent fathers, poverty, genetics, everything but sin, but a depraved heart. And only, they say, until we understand the person will we ever be able to minister the gospel to them. The Bible doesn't tell me that. The Bible shows me that all of our hearts are depraved. You cannot make sense of sin. But here, we address sin with the truth. And the truth matters, church. The truth matters is that we can never understand sin. We will never be able to make sense of it. But that does not hinder the gospel. The gospel exposes sin for what it is. Sin is a transgression against a holy and righteous God. And God is a God of justice who will punish sin and He will justly punish sin. And that's the message which we must take to the world. And last, as we wrap up here this evening, critical race theory it is destructive. It seeks to undermine the authority of Scripture and therefore the truth. Critical race theory is tearing away the fabric of not only society, but a Christian society. It wants to tear down all that once have been social norms. It wants to tear down the home. It wants to tear down the family unit. It wants to completely tear away a fabric. It wants to, uh, uh, it wants the oppressed to then become the oppressors. The gospel, though, exposes it for what it is. It is a device of heresy that should be called out and rejected amongst Bible-believing churches. H.B. Charles said concerning critical race theory, if the diagnosis is wrong, the remedy will never work. He also said of Jesus that Jesus did not seek to overthrow the cultural system, but rather show His disciples how to live in it. Critical race theory requires people to submit to a man, to a man-made system. But as Christians, we only submit to the will of God. And let it be known that the only reason the world hates us is that it hated Christ first. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'll leave you with this, brothers and sisters. Peter said, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering that when His glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, what does He say? Happy are you. Let us not be caught off guard. Persecution is coming. What did Peter do when he was persecuted for the name of Christ? He rejoiced in that he was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. That must be the testimony of all true believers because of critical race theory, because of wokeism, because of all the things that are happening in society today. There is a true line in the sand. And the church must hold its ground. The gates of hell will not prevail. But it will your faith endure. Are you happy when persecution comes. 
all too often my I, I feel timid. Like, I, I, I don't want this to come in my life. And so I pray for grace and I pray for strength and I pray for endurance because I know in my flesh I can't overcome. I would cave. If I'm being honest with you today, I would acquiesce to the culture because that's the nature of my flesh. But the evidence that the Spirit of God is abiding in us and we are abiding in Him we persevere for His glory. In verse 15, he says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in others' matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And pastor, brothers, preachers, I leave you with this. Preach the word. In the face of adversity, preach the word. Proclaim the name of Jesus. Hold fast and don't give up any ground concerning that which is Christ and His church. Pastor, friends, you have been called to task. You are an under-shepherd. The church is the bride of Christ. Oh, we're not like those hirelings that run when danger comes but we stand firm and steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for this time that You've given us here this evening. I thank You for this place and these men. These people have come this evening to, uh, to be encouraged, to be exhorted, to be equipped by the preaching of the Word for the work of the ministry. I thank You for Brother Mark. What a faithful friend he is to me. Father, I thank You for the zeal that You've put in his heart, his desire to be faithful in pro proclaiming Your truth and Your truth alone. O oh, Father, that You've enlightened his eyes to the truth of the Gospel, the pure Word of Jesus Christ. And Father, he has not succumbed, he's not acquiesced to the world. And I pray, Father, that You would give him fruit for his labor and that You would bear up under him and, and his dear family and his wife Valerie. And Lord, that You would continue to use them, Father, as... as uh, as ardent, faithful, courageous uh, ministers here at this church, and that this church truly would be a beacon of light to this community, and that, Father, as many as you have given to Jesus Christ would come to him, and Jesus said he will in no wise cast out, and Jesus will not lose any that the Father has given him. What a faithful shepherd, what a faithful Savior he is. And, Father, help us all to be faithful. Lord, as we as we stand, Lord, and having done all to stand for your glory so that Jesus Christ would be made known to all the world to the glory and to the praise of his most holy and precious name. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. I hope you now have a better understanding, if you didn't, before you came in, of what we're up against in our culture right now, not just in America, but across the world. And we're going to hear more of that, similar things, tomorrow uh, as we continue to dig into this subject. Uh, see, Pastor John, I knew you could handle that. You did more than handle it, brother. Um, that's what we needed, and, and I, I know I am very encouraged by what you've said tonight and brother Harold thank you so much for reminding us of the purity of the gospel we must hold it firm and strong without compromise so what what encouragement you both have been to us all tonight and tomorrow we're going to have uh, more of the same uh, we're going to hear from Philip Dewberry and he's going to talk about the obstacle of big tech that's a big deal today uh, we're going to be hearing from Steve Wainwright back here, and Steve's going to talk about the obstacle of false teaching that's crept into churches. And then uh, Bruce Winter, who's here with us tonight. Bruce, where are you? Oh, there you are. Uh, Bruce is going to be speaking on the obstacle of COVID and mandates, especially with his medical background, and he's perfect uh, to address that. So we're really excited about what we're going to learn and how we can be better and more faithful servants of Christ. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? 
faithful servants to Christ, faithful proclaimers of the message that we thank God he has given, brought to us and saved us through, and that now we actually have the privilege of sharing it with others. We're seed planters, aren't we, folks? I see it over and over again, many seed planting, and sometimes we get to reap. And we do it with joy, and we do it with tears often, uh, but our focus is seed planting. And uh, we want to be faithful to it, that's for sure. Well, folks, thank you uh, for being with us the whole night tonight. And we come back tomorrow at 9 a.m., and um, we're going to start out the morning with uh, Brother Dave Parks, Executive Secretary right here of BFM, and he's going to give us uh, a wonderful update uh, on BFM, what's going on with BFM right now, explaining a lot of what, how BFM works, and we're going to hear from David Pittman also in that, so really important. Please don't miss that opening update to start out our day tomorrow. Um, we're going to hear some wonderful music and just a privilege of worshiping God together. So thank you folks for being here tonight. We're going to close in prayer. Well, we're closing five minutes early. Well, that's unusual. That doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> that's right. That's true. Amen. <laughs> what? That's the press right. I, I, I got to go with you on that. <laughs> Touche, Dave. <laughs> Judd, thank you for the report, man. Uh, we love you. Oh, I... five, he said. Uh, you, the, the laughter shows that everybody knows you better than that, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, man. Been a great evening. All right, folks, we've already, we've already had prayer. Brother John has closed us in prayer, so I hope you have a great evening. Hope you get some good sleep tonight, and hope to see you tomorrow if you can be back. God bless you. <clears throat>